Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The topic that we're going to be talking about in the, in the next panel is the arts in crisis mode. And I think we can all agree that we have, maybe we've been through a moment of crisis or maybe we're still going through one. I was interested, even in some of the panel discussions that we've been having here at the Art for Tomorrow talks, to hear people referring to the pandemic in the past tense. But of course, it's still something that we're dealing with at the moment. But I think there's only so long that you can consider yourself to be living in a crisis and then those circumstances just become our lived reality. And so maybe we're still in a crisis, maybe we're, uh, maybe we, we, we're through the worst of it. But it, the situation that has been unfolding around us has affected every part of our lives. Um, and of course, the arts are not unaffected uh, by this. We've just been through a period in which people throughout most of the world spent a period of lockdown in which they weren't able to leave their homes. So in terms of the visual arts, they weren't able to go into the usual places where they would interact with, uh, with those things. But also we've seen a turn to online technology as a way people have been still consuming a lot of culture. Uh, it just hasn't been in the normal ways uh, that they would do that. So to talk about this extraordinary moment and in fact some other crises that we've been through and what are some of the lessons that we've taken from those. I'm pleased to be joined by Massimiliano Negioni, the uh, artistic director of the New Museum in New York, Mareva Grabowski Mitsotakis, the entrepreneur and cultural patron, and Kam uh, Kamal Manua, the uh, Parisian gallerist and uh, the president and founder of Kamal Manua Gallery. I thought I might start with you, Massimiliano. You are the artistic director of the New Museum in New York. The budget of the museum has just been cut from 14 million to 11 million, and you've laid off a bunch of staff. How much longer do you expect the organization to continue in crisis mode? Uh, well, it's, um, uh, as you just said, you know, uh, first of all, we, the fact that we are here together is somewhat miraculous compared to a few weeks, uh, months ago. And we opened just a show this morning with Jeff Koons, uh, uh, which feels, uh, somewhat effortless, but um, organizing a show of that type and organizing any show in this moment is incredibly complicated. The, the shipment budgets are more expensive between 30 and 50 percent. <laughs> um, you know, installing shows required until a few weeks ago, bringing people uh, to quarantine for uh, seven days, or I just did a show in Shanghai, which I'll never see in person in my life because uh, it requires say, three weeks quarantine period. So uh, as much as this feels somewhat normal with just our pretty masks on, uh, we are very far <laughs> from, from that moment. In New York also, uh, you know, New York in the good and in the bad times has the ability of uh, uh, presenting production in, in all its uh, violence <laughs> and evidence. No, it's uh, New York, and maybe that's the reason why we love it. It's a city of extremes, and that means when things don't work out so nicely, uh, those extremes are visualized most dramatically. I, I was recently, for the first time, in Paris. It was my first trip in two years, and to see the difference of Paris and New York is really uh, staggering. New York, I think, still feels a little hurt. Uh, um, you know, entire blocks of empty storefronts, uh, both on Broadway and Madison. It's also American culture, you know, uh, even through the help of the state, uh, um, the state came in support of the unemployed. It didn't prevent the firings. And, and so that also created a situation which um, became quite explosive in, in, on many levels. And, and that, those were also interesting changes and conversations to have. So, um, you know, we open, we, the, the country opened its borders on November 8th, and I think that's going to be uh, the time that we see if we are still in which level of the crisis we are. I was just reading a piece in the Times last week. The total sales of internet tickets for cultural events in New York City. 70% um, of the total is to tourists, and 50% uh, of the 70% is to international tourists. So that gives you an immediate sense of how audience are uh, just, uh, uh, you know, cancelled by this uh, uh, 
uh, state of and, things. And, and has uh, that been your experience at the new museum that you've had? Yeah, your you know, we, down? we had a few months. We were lucky. The, the museums reopened in August, so all things considered, also compared to France and England. And since August of 2020, we never closed, but we had a mandatory. 25% capacity, which lasted for a long time, and now we are at full capacity, but <laughs> the audience is uh, I mean, just what, not there. Yeah, I mean, how, how we much are of your down a good 30%, give or take, and, um, and, and, and we, you know, we are doing. Uh, interesting enough, I think we might be doing a little better than our grimmest uh, predictions. <laughs> so that's yeah. you know. I mean, but you have got predictions. So, like, talk in terms of talking when we get back to a normal. What is the point in the future we, that we you think you'll be back when you We didn't put a number on it. We didn't put a number, but we planned very conservatively for 2021, 2022, and um, I don't remember if we just say we're going to be back to normal. And uh, we were also in the middle of a, an expansion, which fortunately had not started yet. We didn't literally break ground. We didn't have a construction site, but that also, um, you know, had an impact on the way we, we thought of uh, of our business. On the other hand, and this I know sounds maybe a little romantic or, or just uh, trying to find a silver lining, there, there was a sense of participation and uh, a sense of urgency and necessity that I think in the cultural sector we haven't felt in a long time. You know, the, when the museums open, the encounter in the uh, galleries or to be back uh, confronted with artworks uh, felt more necessary and inspiring and cathartic than ever. So, um, you know, I, I am, having seen the crisis of the early 90s, which was a financial crisis, but what I learned was, particularly in the States, that there was a moment also of creative flourishing. You know, if you think many of the artists we celebrate today um, were moving their first steps in a New York that was uh, coming out of a dark recession. So, you know, here is to open that, that from this crisis also a lot of uh, transformations and, um, and new paths for growth uh, also emerge. I think the, the previous conversation around diversity also was clearly ex accelerated by the recent events. Not the, uh, it's the stuff you read in um, history books, no? a combination of financial crisis, uh, social uh, discontent, <laughs> and uh, you know, that led to positive revolutions in the past. And so I think also what we have witnessed will result in changes that were more sudden and you know, also more positive than we probably expected. What about in terms of the work that artists are producing? Kamal, you work with some of the most successful contemporary artists uh, in Europe. You're very close to them. You talk with them all the time. You see them at work. How do you feel that this moment of crisis is starting to filter down into the art that we'll see tomorrow? Um, as Massimo said, it was so uh, sudden. Crisis came and smashed the world, not only art, every industri industries. At that time, in March, I remember, as it was yesterday, I was uh, in Taiwan for the Biennale and flying back to, to Europe, to Maastricht. And at that time, all the crowd, the audience, we didn't know what was uh, going on. Um, I remember I was, have, I was showing a Utopian project. Uh, it was very interesting to see how, by accident, I, was, um, uh, I had the vision to present to the audience uh, a, a utopian romanticism from Friedrich, the end of the world, you know, uh, from the 19th century to Hugo Ondinon. And I remember the landscape, darks, you know, with Victor Hugo, those kind of things, was bringing what would happen to us when we were back because the fair was cut in the middle, we couldn't stop, we couldn't finish the fair, and I was. We all came, you know. This uh, is the Tefa Fair in Moscow. Tefa Fair, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, Tefa Fair. And when we came, uh, uh, just after that, our government in France uh, uh, told that we had to stay home. As many of the countries, it was very strange, weird. We didn't know how to behave, how to speak to the employees, the, the artists. Um, um, so it was extremely um, something that we all never lived. And at that point, I thought how to uh, uh, reset the machine. I was very smashed. It was one of the first times that I didn't know what to do and what not to do. I was calling all the artists every day. At that time, we were working very hard 
with the, we had two artists in the next Biennale that you were the director some years before. One of the artists that you were showing at the uh, new museum, Camille Enro, you know, um, in the Kessner Museum in, in, in Germany, we were working, and the two artists of the Biennale was Latif Aishach for the Swiss Pavilion and Zineb Sedira in the French one. And most of the, 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 the appointments were physical. We were having uh, 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 meetings with uh, uh, different uh, engineers and architects, blah, 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 and everything stopped. So how to do and how to work with the artists and how to fundraise the money. As you may know, you, we are uh, private galleries and we are helping, assisting the artists. I didn't know. I was really uh, reading at that time books, poetry, and I didn't know. And the first thing I did, it, it's a little bit naive, but I created a show at the gallery combining drawing by children and artists, my artists and other artists. And we were showing them at the gallery, you know, sticked on the walls with no frame, and selling them to a charity. Why a charity? Because at that time, I had the feeling to give positive uh, 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 situation to the crowd and the audience, trying to, to open a little bit the windows to something more positive. Just after that, to come back to your question of the artist, I asked two of the artists that were supposed to be presented a little bit later, Daniel Buren and Philippe Pareno, to, uh, um, uh, to present their show a little bit early in the new space that we were opening. It was an immersive show with curtains that Philippe presented at the Tate at that time, you know, and the kind of uh, landscape of, made by glass, mirror glass columns by Daniel Buren. And at that time in Paris, all museums were closed. And as private deal deal dealers, we were the only cultural place which, w which was open to the public. And we had crowds, you know, we had uh, uh, hundreds of lines of young people who couldn't get to the coffee, theater, whatever. Getting there, it was an immersive landscape. So it's a, it was a, a very, as you said, historical moment that we were smashed and we, we were trying to stand up, to try to live again and to know what to do and not to do. It was very, very special. I, I think it's, it sounds like an enormously creative solution that you've come up to, but I think we can all understand, all, all relate to. Resilience, trying to, and creativity. Because of but the artist. I mean, I'm sure that not all of us have your resilience or your creativity. I think we could probably relate to that feeling you said of like not knowing what to do before. And so I thought perhaps we could, I mean, one of the things you can do when you don't know what to do is to look at historical examples of what happened then and try and um, find some lessons to take from that. And I thought we could bring you in here, Mareva, because you're from Greece and we've been talking about at the moment the, the crisis of the pandemic. But Greece is a country that's been buffeted by crises for the past 10 years as a journalist, we've been reporting about uh, a, a debt crisis, a Euro crisis, uh, a, a refugee crisis, and Greece has been at the sharp end of all of these. And I wonder if you could maybe from the, from the Greek experience, if you could maybe give us an idea of some ways in which uh, arts organizations or, or policymakers generally have taken something positive from, from the experience of, uh, of dealing with a crisis and coming out into a new normal at the end? Uh, I think, first of all, that, um, I mean, you, it's true that you have to define the pandemic crisis with an economic and financial crisis is two different things. Because I think, as Massimiliano and Kamel very well said, the pandemic was a paralysis. The economic crisis, the financial crisis, is, is you could flourish. I mean, art flourishes during these type of crises. It's an opportunity, it's a challenge for artists to get out there. They're not paralyzed like the pandemic. It's not, you're not in isolation. So I think that in Greece, given that for the last 10 years we've been in a constant crisis, the pandemic was something completely different. We had already uh, started, there was innovative artistic expression before the pandemic. Uh, there were independent, um, there were galleries, there were public institutions, there were state institutions working towards the, in the crisis, uh, the financial crisis, and working in, a, in chaos, because the last 10 years have really been chaotic. So, 
we were sort of accustomed, and I think culture, not only art. A film, the film industry in the last two years has blossomed. Contemporary art has flourished in Greece. Uh, independent non-profit spaces. I think what, what the financial crisis did, there are, there are many stakeholders. Uh, I would say there are public institutions, there are state institutions, there are non-profit public spaces, there are galleries, new galleries, old galleries that have been, tra there's, there's a transformation and there's a lot of, they were, because it was a financial crisis, there was a lot of ener energized people that were trying to, to work and get out there and bring uh, to the scene Greece and Athens. So, I think that it was a bit different when the when the pandemic came. You know, it was it was a very isolating moment, and and I think because of these uh, stakeholders that had been established uh, that were there, I think it helped this isolate this isolation to sort of not get, you know, not to, to be depressed, not to completely, you know, sort of all the work that had been done was still there and was just waiting for an opportunity to open up. And I think one of the important things is that there were four or five uh, private non-profits, you know, whether it was Deste or Neon, Deste from da Dakis Ioannou along with his IDRA project, whether it was Neon, Neon from uh, Dimitris Daskalopoulos, whether it was with, with the projects, the Gormley project in the middle of the pandemic in Delos, the Portals project, Onassis, uh, Onassis Cultural Center, Nyarkos, these were still there and were trying to that, pr produce, that is produce work. That is true if, I mean, if you were lucky enough to get your hands on those grants, but for um, artists in recipient of funds from the state, I mean, the culture ministry's budget was cut in half. Complete, but, but that, the budget cuts were from before. Yeah. Okay, so, so they had felt that the, the cutting of budgets was there because of the economic crisis. Exactly. That's why I said I mean, that's that the what I mean, pandemic, sorry, not in terms of the pandemic. That's why the, the pandemic was, you know, was just a bit a smaller slash yeah. in what the budget cut. For example, you know, we managed to, to have some exhibitions like the, uh, the uh, African uh, art of uh, Harry David shown at the uh, new contemporary art uh, museum. Uh, we managed to, to do things despite what was going on. The, I think one of the important things for the pandemic is that the new government that came in managed to, to help, to, to give some incentives, to help the private institutions and to do more on the, on the contemporary art. Uh -huh. Put the, the, uh, there's a minister, a deputy minister of contemporary art, which never existed. We were only about archaeology in Greece. You know, a contemporary art was not that important. So that is because he really focuses on that, on film, on uh, digital, on visual arts, on, on contemporary, pushed new, uh, new director of the uh, curator of the uh, contemporary art, Katerina Gregos. More, there's a lot that, is, that happened during the pandemic, despite the paralysis that was going on. Um, you, the economic crisis, I think, brings different things, and the, the pandemic, another different I mean, area. We, but we are now, maybe if the pandemic is behind us or we're out of the woods with that, we're now going to have to live with an economic crisis um, in terms of that. Massimiliano, I was asking you before about budget cuts at the, at the new museum. Do you look at the Greek example and think, well, maybe if you slash a budget, it's not always doom and gloom. It can actually be a spur for creativity, cause us um, to rethink things and actually lead us into a good position, perhaps? Well, first of all, to give credit where credit is due, the Greek invented the word crisis, so they are definitely comfortable yeah. with it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which actually means choice, going back to your, to your question. And uh, again, to, to, 
to be a little ironic, uh, as Mediterranean and let's say Arabic countries, we are also very much accustomed to improvisation in danger, um, which is not exactly a modus operandi that applies to American culture, I think. You know, we, uh, for, and I, I'm generalizing, but I do believe this, you know, we are cultures that can sail through chaos uh, uh, because we have witnessed also empire crumble very frequently. We, we are very, you know, adaptive and porous. Uh, and that, I think, has, um, I don't know if he has helped us, but he has had a different type of uh, reaction even to the pandemic. Also, you know, most notably that there are systems of social assistance in Europe that are very different from, you know, the, the kind of advanced uh, liberal system of America, you know, the, the f Largely, Europe was not allowed to fire anybody, and, and all that created, I think, a cushion that is not so present in America. On the other hand, that lack of assistance then results in tremendous growth in America when, um, you know, when things start to pick up again. Uh, even though now there is an interesting also phenomenon that is specific to America of you know, uh, people who are giving up their jobs, uh, people that are not returning to jobs. No, they were, uh, usually every month you are told how many people are hired in America, and I think last month we learned that four million people just quit their jobs, yeah. and uh, who knows, you know, they moved, they went elsewhere, and so on. So there is also maybe a, a kind of anthropological change even yeah. in America at work. I, I don't think we would ever sit down and say, you know, the lack of budget is going to make us more creative. Um, I think you learn to find solutions, but I think nobody responsible would go about it. You know, jobs that are cut, uh, it means people who don't have support, they don't have their means of subsistence and so on. So, um, you know, what I think also was interesting in America, um, which relies so heavily on private donations, was that Fortunately, the world of finances didn't collapse. On the other hand, actually, you know, I don't know enough about finance and Wall Street, but the returns were amazing in 2020 and 20, and that, I think, helped a lot of institutions to survive because the donors didn't pull back because donations kept coming. And that has, I think, uh, helped a lot of um, institutions in America, which you know, notoriously get support from private donors. Come on, that's one of your jobs as a gallerist is to help convert f finance and riches and money into, to, to, to get that towards artists, to give them the space uh, to work and, uh, and, and to create. Do you think that this is maybe going to be a, a, a moment of, of opportunity for that? If, if we see a, a, a boom, that, that maybe it could be a, a good moment for, for artists? You know, um, Massimo, we were speaking about substitution. You know, the donators were before collapse, and some financial guys who had tremendous uh, profits came back. So it's because this is Darwin. You know, it, there's always opportunity in such kind of situation. I would say uh, in, my, in my job, um, um, now galleries are extremely healthy and then we are going uh, uh, to the point that we were before, even uh, some galleries expanded, uh, opened new spaces. So because uh, uh, art uh, um, collectors were frustrated during this time, the pandemic uh, fed them the frustration and they wanted to eat art and art elevate elevate human being. So um, in, in this moment, in, in, even if I'm very struggling to understand the time, because it's understanding where we are going to. This is you know, either uh, fin uh, the, the, the end of the fairs, I don't think so, um, the digitalization, how you get with artists to uh, help them to assist and to, to sell them in another way. There's different uh, manners. Uh, that we uh, um, uh, learned extremely quickly. It was a very uh, a short period of time to understand and to learn. And as I was saying, you know, Darwin, you understand or you don't understand. Either you take the train or you don't take the train. We all fight a lot, struggle to take the train. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the train was, was totally stopped. And at one point, he started to come back Museum and as you know, my city now is booming. Yeah. Everyone is wants to, you know, everyone needs to go to Paris now. 
it's incredible, no? But I wonder what, so for instance, thinking about the about fairs, um, which is one of the main places at which art is presented and, and sold, since the Art World merry-go-round has restarted again, I've been to Art Basel and to Freeze in London, and I noticed there a lot of caution amongst the, just the, the galleries in what they're presenting. No one really brings a solo show anymore. People bring things they know they can sell easily because they were so close to the to the wire, really, in a moment where they couldn't really sell their wares at all. I, I mean, I don't know if you agree with that characterization. I, I mean, I, I'm not talking about your booth, I'm talking about generally. But, you know, when but you how start, long do you think we'll be in a moment like that? When you start to eat again, you don't eat only couscous yeah. or, uh, or bœuf bourguignon, you know? You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, it's but, a, but, a joke but my that question is, how long are we going to have to eat rice risky. before we can eat? It's not food. because of it's risky or not. It's, uh, galleries had to afford and to bring to the audience all the artists, you couldn't frustrate the others from the inventory of the artists that you are working with to bring only one. It's egoistic. So, mm -hmm. of course, uh, art uh, galleries had to present as much as they could, you know, to feed the artists and to feed the audience. It's my point of view. Mariva, I wonder if, um, I mean, have, uh, you are a collector of, of art. Is, do you think that we're entering perhaps a moment of, uh, of caution or of less experimentation, particularly in terms of the art which is brought to the market? I think, you know, from a collector's point of view, I think that, as Elif said in the beginning, uh, you know, you're not, what was yesterday is not going to come back tomorrow. You know, forget about yesterday. So what you need to think is a different way of seeing things. There's a different tomorrow. Uh, I think, I don't know about art fairs if they're gonna go back to what they were, uh, but I'd, I'd rather see more substance and more, you know, shows that are really, uh, you know, in depth. I would see there was too much movement with not so much substance before. So I think that this pandemic has the empathy part, has more about talking about the artist, talking about the background of the artist, you know, if it's a woman, if it's a man, what's his background, what, you know, there's more in depth. So I, I'm not sure that we're gonna see what we saw. They, the, the gallerists, and, and Kamel is one of the top gallerists, so he, he knows better. But I think that they'll have to reinvent a new way of dealing with their clients and the collectors, and the artists themselves, and how they promote the artists also. You know, how, how do they really bring them in the forefront? Um, talking, you know, I, I felt that everything was very fast before, and it was more a la mode rather than really substance. Kamal, you're nodding. How are you going to do it? And she's right. I mean, uh, we are all reinventing our way of working, you know. There, there would be still fairs, it's my feeling. Um, but that's right that we are maybe more uh, reacting and interacting with people. Uh, observing and explaining more, maybe, because we, we are uh, in, in, in this situation, in the, con in the context that we want to give, we want to feed, we want to, to, be the, to transfer what, what we hear from the artist to the, to, to the audience, to the museum, to explain. She was speaking about superface, 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 oh, it's hard, superficiality, you know, you understand. Um, we were all racing, you know, from a fair to another fair, from museum, a biennale, a show, with no time to, 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 you know, to take it and to give it. And because of this time, which was totally floating for two years, we had time to understand where we didn't want to go, where we didn't want to go. We don't know where to go, but we know what we do not want to do anymore. I, I, it's really my, my feeling now. I exactly know what I want to do in the, ten, in the next 10 years. You know, this kind of what she was saying as a collector. You know, she has, she feels more substance, more content, more explanation, more um, position, you know, from the galleries that she are, she's uh, 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 used to visit. You what need to digest. 
you know, I didn't, I didn't even have time to digest what I was looking was at, nice. to go and read. And, you know, it was from one thing to the other without really, I just felt there was no substance. During the COVID, I started going back and seeing what's at each piece of art because I had more time. You know. but, but now, so that was in a, a very extreme moment in which, I mean, I live in Germany, we weren't even allowed to leave the house after 10 o'clock, so you've got a lot of time to think. Now we're, we're free to do those things again. Do you think that your behaviours have been changed by the experience of, of lockdown in terms of how you will consume art and how you will experience it? I personally think that my, my, be, my personal behaviour has changed because it has made me think of other things that I didn't have time to think. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're in such a, such a crisis and you see so many people around you really dying, uh, you start thinking differently. And, and you start slowing down and valuing things that you had just, that had stepped aside, that you were not really paying attention. Even the communication that you had with people. It, I, I felt that even through Zoom, I wanted more time. I wanted to ask more questions. I wanted, I questioned things more. Uh, I don't really want to go completely back where I was. Like I was saying about, we won't go back. So I want to adapt to something that's where, where there is knowledge. You know, I, I found the, a leaf which I had not uh, heard. I've read her books, but I had not heard. I found fascinating what she said about, uh, about human beings and about the empathy. In the art world, it was non-existent. You know, about artists, about what has happened to them, about how they lived, their backgrounds, what happened to them 20, 30 years ago, which might not be something that happened today, you know. I mean, there's so much around it. Uh, and, and I think I'd like to see things a bit differently. Still, gallerists, top museums, gallerists like Kamel or people like Massimiliano, they'll be there because they, they have depth to what they were doing. You know, they, they really, their galleries, you know that the artists that they, they pick, you know that they've done a lot of homework in order to pick them up. You know, and, that, and there you feel comfortable because the collector has to feel comfortable also with the galleries than what he has done. We've got about uh, seven minutes left. So are there any questions from anyone on the floor who'd like to ask for the, panel, for the panelists? Yeah, the question I wanted to put to, um, to you is um, the art world, I mean, the auctions have gone through the roof again. It just seems that art has this, uh, it seems almost limitless value, and yet it could also be a bubble. I mean, how far can these values go? Um, I don't know whichever one wants to answer. Come on, maybe Come you can take that one. Okay. No, uh, you know. That's right, there was a kind of parallel between the pandemic crisis and the incredible results and the, um, the, 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 the auction incredible uh, position um, that we were, were all reading in books or you know, experimenting. Uh, in the moment, there's a lot of, Massimiliano was speaking about finance, money is there, you know, there was not a crash in Wall Street. So, you know, those guys, when they have tons of profits, they are buying. They want to, you know, to invest and to get in this territory, which, uh, which is sometimes old for, or, or new for them. And so that's why, you know, this uh, pandemic brought to the audience uh, new uh, uh, people who were very interested to get in that. So, you know, we never know when it will finish. But for the moment, there are so many people who are investing that I don't see the limit. Here. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, after the crisis, we started even to shift as academics of how we 
uh, tell students about not just making is also the curation part. So they became their own curators just because um, the galleries or the, the collectors can't reach to them and find all these young talents. So a lot of them started going to like the curation and also finding their own ways of telling their stories. So they started depending on social media or like just to like and also getting a lot of views. So to get validation in some sorts um, and also NFTs. So now it's like the market is open for that thing all, all, all uh, of a sudden and getting excited about. So how do you think institutions can start modifying to accommodate these young talents that they're coming, that they also have a lot of validation from the market and all these publics that they're cheering for them, but there are other institutions that they're, they're not up to their standards maybe, or they're different, they don't have the same agenda. So what do you think? Mariva, how, how do you think that, that older institutions can learn some things from what young people have been doing throughout this crisis? Uh, I think that the, the institutions, I think from these uh, non-profit non art spaces of, you know, uh, beginner artists were very important because I think they, they established these artists, they had the voice, they felt important, uh, and, and I think that uh, public institutions, uh, but as well as uh, galleries, I think are paying more attention. I think they, they, they don't only look at the artists uh, themselves in their studios, but I think that they pay more attention to all these spaces where there were energized groups that really uh, did work uh, together and that had the voice and uh, uh, and I think that what they had learned, the, the whole the whole art world has changed in in terms from these people because they had no. Um, I I feel that the large the museums and the and the galleries maybe at a certain point, but I wouldn't say about the galleries because galleries do go after young generation, uh, the younger artists that they see in schools and the fine arts. I know that most galleries, they, they go and they follow. The, the good ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the good ones. Uh, but, but I think it was a good lesson through these. The, it, is a, it was a great move that they opened these spaces of creativity. Um, I think, I think you'll see these uh, going through. I think it's going to be one more space, existing space. I think what's important is the sustainability issue is extremely important. Is how are you going to keep this going? How are these institutions going to keep these uh, non-profits going? How are they going to help them? It's a very, it's a very good question of how, how are they going to really step in and, and help them um, stay there, uh, grow, uh, expand. Um, I'm not sure how, how this is going to happen. Maybe, maybe Kamel uh, has a, a better maybe answer. Kamel, but just ever so briefly, do you have any idea of how we can turn that into a more sustainable practice? No, I'm living my time, you know, so I'm following artists. I'm always smelling artists. Smelling artists means getting to their way of perspective. Uh, um, for the moment, all, most of the young artists were, as you were saying, a young lady, um, they, were, they are extremely isolated. So they're working with networks and you know, trying to, uh, to uh, get achievement with decoration, whatever. But I mean, it's always time, time who brings the real artist to the, to the territory. So I'm very um, positive for that because with time, Oh, it's, they always get to the surface. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kamal, and thank you, Mareva. Um, and thanks to the audience. We're going to take a 15-minute break now, and then we'll be back with our final talk of the day. Thank you. Thank you.